We are in the third and final week of a stewardship series of sermons dealing with the idea of responding to God. Stewardship, meaning how we use the resources God has given us, how we decide and allocate those, but how they reveal our response to God's grace. Last week, we read the story of someone who walked away from God's grace, a man who couldn't give up his belongings. We also read the story of Abraham being asked to sacrifice his son Isaac, which was similar in that God said, oh, there's just one more thing we need from you. Today we're reading a very familiar story about a man who has a very different response to the grace of Jesus Christ. And this comes to us from the 19th chapter of Luke's Gospel, the first 10 verses. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there was named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome Jesus. All who saw it began to grumble and said, he has gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Lord, half my possessions, Lord, half my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you all know what an earworm is? It's a song that sort of gets stuck in your head. Sometimes that's a good thing. That helps when you're picking hymns to go with sermons and to go with the scripture of the day, to hear a little phrase that repeats over and over again in your mind. Now, I always say, whenever we read this story, everybody goes back in their minds to Sunday school and vacation Bible school. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. As if this were a children's kind of story because he's short. He may be about the size of a child, but he has nothing in common with children because this is a man who really has done some terrible things. So as I was sitting working on the sermon, another song came to mind. This one from, I think, the 70s by someone named Randy Newman. It says, short people got no reason. Short people got no reason. Short people got no reason to live. They got little hands and little eyes. They walk around telling great big lies. They got little noses and tiny little teeth. They wear platform shoes on their nasty little feet. Well, I don't want no short people, don't want no short people, don't want no short people around here. Now, he wrote that as a song that would shed some light on prejudice and how ridiculous it was. Unfortunately, a lot of short people sort of took issue with him thinking he was complaining about them. Now, I can relate to being not quite tall because I remember going to the beach with my parents when I was just a little thing and my dad walking my sister and I out into the surf. He had one of us by each hand and he kept going farther and farther out and I was saying, Dad, Dad, it's too deep. And he said, it's not that deep at all. Well, when you're over six feet, it's not that deep, but when you're not quite four feet, it gets deep really fast. Or I remember trying to see parades when I was a kid and my parents would go to the 4th of July parade in Taos and they would take us very early so we could get a seat on the curb so we could see. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to. Zacchaeus was short in stature, which was just one of the reasons people could literally look down on him, but they looked down on him in a different sense as well. As we said in the story, he wasn't just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector, which meant that he had more power to even steal money from the other tax collectors who were stealing money from the people. He would charge more than they were supposed to pay and he would keep it for himself and he had become a very wealthy man. So when he hears that Jesus is coming along, he wants to see him. We don't know what spoke to his heart that made him want to go out there. Maybe he had heard the rumors about this man who could restore sight to the blind and hearing to the deaf, who could raise people up from death to new life or back to their life, not new life, not resurrection, but resuscitation. He brought people back out of his great compassion. He had fed a multitude of people with very little food. And he has come into Jericho, and the word about him has spread, and the crowd has grown. Well, you know, if you can't get around a tax collector any other way, at least when he's short, you can sort of elbow him out of the way and get him to the back of the crowd. But being unable to see Jesus, he runs ahead and he climbs the tree. 
and he sees Jesus, but more importantly, Jesus sees him and calls him by name. Now, if you know someone's name, you usually know something about them, and you know about their sinfulness in this case because everybody didn't like Zacchaeus. Nobody liked him. Short people got no reason to live. But Jesus looks at him and says, Zacchaeus, come down, because I'm going to your house today. And Zacchaeus' life changes there. You want another earworm, that old hymn, that old standard we sang this morning, what a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lighted my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Or maybe when John read from Isaiah this morning, Isaiah's call to ministry, Maybe when you heard his answer when he said, Whom shall I send and who shall go for us? Here I am, Lord, is it I, Lord? But just like Zacchaeus, it starts with being confronted with your own sinfulness. Because Jews believed that if they ever saw God face to face, that they would die because the awe and the majesty were too great and they were too sinful to look upon the face of God. But Isaiah is there and the grandeur of God fills up the temple and the smoke and the voices of the speaking seraphim and the cherubim and the grandeur surround him. And confronted with such majesty and awe, he says what I'm sure all of us would say, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips. How can I say anything for you? And God says, oh, I can fix that. And the angel flies with the tongs, takes the coal and touches his lips and burns away all his impurities. And so he is restored and he is able to go and speak for God as God's great prophet, one of the great prophets of Scripture. Zacchaeus is never going to be a great prophet of Scripture, but his life is going to be changed completely by his encounter with Jesus. Jesus doesn't just call him by name. Jesus goes into his home, which was scandalous to the Jews around listening, because who would associate with someone so lowly, such a degenerate, such an evil man as this tax collector, who would go there but someone just as unclean as he himself? But Zacchaeus is not stopped by other people's opinions. He focuses on Jesus and he has him to his home and he puts out a spread for him. And the company that he kept probably would be other sinners and tax collectors. But in front of the grumblers and the judges and in front of Jesus, he says, Lord, Half my possessions I will give to the poor. Half. We're not talking a tithe here. We're talking 50%. Half of what I own I'm going to give away to the poor. Do you remember the man last week, the, the young man who went away sad because he had too many possessions and he could not give them up because Jesus said, give your possessions to the poor and follow me. He couldn't do that, but Zacchaeus isn't even asked to do that. It just comes out of him in response to the grace he has been shown. And so Zacchaeus has a changed heart. On the people that he cheated, he's going to pay them back four times what he took from them. It doesn't leave him a lot of money, does it? But it leaves him with a clean heart and a changed attitude. Because that is what Christ does when he comes into our lives. He takes away our sin just as the angels in Isaiah flew to him and took the words that he had spoken that were untrue from his lips because he had been a man of unclean lips and put in them a message from God. And Zacchaeus, just the same way, when he is confronted with his own sinfulness, he changes his life because the sinfulness that confronts him is wrapped in the grace of Jesus of Nazareth, who passed that way and looked up and knowing exactly who he was, called him by name and his life changed. That gave me another earworm the whole song doesn't work, but the beginning does. All of me. Why not take all of me? Can't you see that I'm no good without you? Or more than that, a song, a praise song. It's a little bit older now, probably from the 80s. I have a master. He formed my heart. Before even time began, my life was in his hands. He knows my name. He knows my every thought. He sees each tear that falls, and he hears me when I call. Zacchaeus, like the young man in last week's story, had been bound by his stuff. 
He had been bound by his possessions, but he was also bound by the judgment of others because if you're going to be hated, you might as well make something on the side. So he took advantage of both his position as a tax collector, a chief tax collector, but also his position because what else did he have to lose? No one decent spoke to him anyway, so he might as well make a profit. But when he met Christ, his life changed. And I hope that's where we all find ourselves today, in a place where when Christ comes into our hearts, when we understand the depth of God's love for us, the only thing we can do is to respond. All of me, Christ, take all of me. Can't you see that I was no good without you? I was no good before you. And to understand that God calls us by name. God knows each of us, inside, outside, upside down. God knows what we've done right. God knows what we've done wrong. God knows what we failed to do. God knows who we failed to love. And God's grace is sufficient, poured out through Jesus Christ. This story has a little bit of money involved in it because Zacchaeus makes good with his possessions on what he has been asked to do just by being confronted with the grace of God in Jesus Christ. God didn't compel him to do what he did. But meeting Christ brought forth this response from him that made everything he had available to God for God's good use. That's what stewardship is about. It does include our money, but it includes our hearts as well. If we would give up our judgment of others, if we would welcome others in Christ's name, the church would be overflowing, not with holy, holy, holy people, but with sinners in need of grace like you and like me, so that together, wrapped in the grace of God, given to us through our Savior Jesus Christ, we might be made new. We might sing, here I am, Lord. But we might sing also, my chains are gone, I've been set free. How amazing is God's grace. Please open your hearts to know that you are loved, that you are welcomed, that you have been redeemed by a love that we cannot even imagine or measure and then sing, my chains are gone, I've been set free, unending love, amazing grace. Amen.